poison indeed. Poison to Yums. Eggs? Kill the Gnome King? <laughs> nope. I kill the Gnome King. But it took me four tries to do it. Hi, I'm Doug Averly, and I was lucky enough to be one of the clay animators who worked on Return to Oz. Now, don't ask me about the sets, don't ask me about the actors. I wasn't even there. That was all going on in England while we were doing the clay animation in Portland, Oregon. We were manipulating clay and trying to bring the Gnome King and his dominion to life. I've always been interested in filmmaking and special effects. I'd watch all the sci-fi movies out there, the good ones. And the bad ones. All right, hang on. I would make my own movies and I would draw my family and friends in to help put together one of my epics. The most valuable treasure in all the universe. We can't live without it. And do you know what that is? Mm -hmm. Sand. One of my films required aliens made out of clay, so I taught myself stop-motion animation. Then I heard about Will Vinton Productions in Portland, Oregon. Will had coined the term claymation to describe what they did. They looked at my films, they saw examples of my sculpting abilities, and after a couple of tries, they hired me. When I first arrived, the studio was located in this lovely little Victorian house Will had built a studio space off the backside, and in the front was a father-son barbershop. And now it's a medical arts building. Oh well, nothing stays the same. But that's okay, the building was crammed with everything they were doing for the adventures of Mark Twain. So I actually had to work across the street, right in this white stucco building. This. This white stucco. I know I left it here somewhere. Oh well. We called it the Annex. It was the commercial division that we set up so that cash could be brought in while everybody else was working on Twain. Some of the Twain sets found their way over here too. But it was then that I discovered why I was really hired. It seems there's a sequence in Twain called The Mysterious Stranger where a death mask character creates a village of people out of mud. Do these guys remind you of anyone? Apparently, the more experienced animators had a hard time making the animation look crude enough. Well, that's what I was told. At least I got to animate a really cool destruction sequence. Now, while I was in there animating on Twain, there were meetings going on in the room right across from me. Meetings about Oz. Will, how did Walter hear about you? Walter originally saw one right before, right about the time he was trying to figure out what he was gonna do. He just had been awarded this uh, idea of, of doing <coughs> Return to Oz with Disney. And uh, I think he saw it at, I think the Mill Valley Film Festival, one of our one or two of our, our films, and uh, was intrigued. And uh, very, very early on in the whole process, this is way pre-production, <laughs> before you know anybody was even involved or storyboarding was being done or anything, he um, contacted us and ultimately came up to the studio and we spent some time just, just blue-skying what he was thinking about and it was really a pretty cool time because of course it's really at the, at the formative you know creation stage of things he uh, he really didn't know for sure how he wanted to deal with the gnomes and he right off the early on he loved the idea that the gnomes move in the rock like fish in water um you know sort of coming out at the surface you know re in sort of relief in, in some ways, I think it, the hardest thing was really the thing I talked about a little bit, which was trans making claymation go from 
you know, these rather sort of cute little, e e extreme little little uh, little characters, clearly sculpted in in some medium, a soft and soft medium. In this case, it's actually hard, but but a, a clay version, and to transforming that material to be, you know, characters of rock, and um, that's that was. You know, I mean, that worried me the most um, because early on, that I, I wasn't sure that that was going to we were going to be able to pull that off. A cold winter descended over Portland. It was 17 degrees on some days. I went into work. I had a bad cold, and the building never seemed to get warm. I continued with Oz tests. Do you remember the scene where the ledge collapses and Dorothy swallowed up? Well, Walter wanted to know what it would be like to travel through solid rock. So I built a loaf of clay and sliced through it one frame at a time. And then I would take it and tunnel through it as well. And then I built a block of translucent soap that we lit from the outside. That I cut away one piece at a time. Then I tunneled through that. Then I used a water pick to wash off layer after layer of the soap. <sighs> Nothing seemed to work. My cold got worse and worse, and no matter how much I turned up the thermostat, the building seemed to get colder and colder. Then Will burst in and said, why is the heating bill so high? And I said, what heat? Then he led me down a little back hallway, through a door, down into a basement, and there was this octopus-like furnace pumping out heat, but it just wasn't going anywhere. So Will took a careful look at it and discovered that a crankshaft had been broken off that went to a fan that put the heat out to the rest of the building. A quick call to the furnace repair people and the problem was fixed. But not for me. Will sent me home for a couple of days to recover from my cold. By the spring of 1984, the work on Twain was nearly complete and we had a green light to start Oz. But it was obvious to Will and David and Barry that we just didn't have a building big enough to be able to house all the work needed for Oz. So the Gnome King, his messengers, in fact, the whole claymation dominion was shot here. Oh good, it's still here. I was beginning to worry. The front area used to be a Montessori school, but the warehouse area was packed floor to ceiling with wicker furniture. One of the animators sarcastically called it a wicker wonderland. Now Nicole Williamson made a splendid Gnome King, but he wasn't the first choice. One of the front runners was Leo McKern, a British actor better known for his role as Rumpel of the Bailey, long running British TV series. He was short and round and he looked more like the Gnome King that's described in the old Frank Baum books, more like an egg itself. Now Barry Bruce did a sculpture of Leo McKern as the Gnome King. In it he put these artificial eyes which were the only ones we had at the time. They weren't fully rounded, they were just spheres like large contact lenses. We did quite um, uh, you know, elaborate 3D versions you know, ultimately with really nice eyes and so forth. In fact the very last version of, uh, of uh, the Gnome King's face had these prosthetic eyes that uh, matched Nicole's uh, were especially made for that that particular purpose so that and that was weird that was eerie you know just to sort of see those real eyes inside of this clay you know sort of being you know, it's pretty strange I actually did that in closed Mondays too and it was just the freakiest thing always to have this a, you know a bust of a character that's big life-size and having you know these real eyes sort of staring all the time <laughs> it's just it's really a, a little disconcerting you know who catches you by surprise barry's leo bust was marvelous but eventually walter selected nicole williamson as the gnome king which meant he had to do another sculpture but we only had that one set of eyes so he ripped the eyes out of leo and put them into nicole the Leo McKern sculpture sat around the studio for months with its eye sockets all torn out and jagged where the lenses had been pulled out to put into the other model. Somebody made the comment that maybe Leo had been vacationing in the south of France and seagulls pecked his eyes out. <laughs> you gotta watch falling asleep on the beach in some of those places. <laughs>
live action shooting had already started. Will, and sometimes Barry, were off to England to consult with Walter on the filming. It was really, really interesting. I really got to know Walter and got to love him uh, immensely over, you know, these, this period of time. You know, the trips were fairly quiet and fairly thoughtful because that was Walter's, really, his style. But there were also these, uh, we always talked about and, and tried to, and figure it out in some, some cases, uh, you know, issues around the special effects and the gnomes and all that sort of thing, which was what my function was there. But we also <laughs> would get onto just all kinds of just wonderful, um, uh, very, very esoteric kinds of, uh, you know, subjects um, that were just kind of wild and out there. And I learned that that's, that's something that uh, Walter does for as recreation, you know, all the time. We began building sets based on the live action sets and characters based on Barry's designs. I mean, it just, it just goes to show you there were so many different avenues of experimentation that were going on during that period. Pretty cool, pretty amazing stuff. And then the bottom fell out of the project. Walter was fired. The details are sketchy, but from what I understand, Disney didn't like what they saw in the dailies and they shut the production down. We heard about this on a Friday, so we had all weekend to stew about it. And it was such a massive production for us that we didn't have any other jobs coming in. We were jobless. I only know this kind of from Walter's point of view. And, and I, you know, I don't know what the, what the you know, more public perception uh, of all of that was. Um, Walter, um, I mean, that didn't last very long, as I remember, from, from Walter's point of view, mostly because he did have this support of, of people like George and Francis and even Spiel, uh, Spielberg, I think, at, some point, at, at one stage in, the, in that process as well. But by Monday, Walter was back. It doesn't hurt to have friends like Steven Spielberg and George Lucas. So we got down to work. The script was broken down into sections involving gnomes or the Gnome King, and each section was assigned to an animator. The first section included all the various faces that appeared on rocks above ground when Dorothy arrived in Oz. These were animated by Craig Bartlett. Craig had to match the shape and lighting and color of the original rock exactly. There was one shot in the Deadly Desert where Dorothy steps on top of one of the messenger rocks. Her shadow fell across the rock for maybe 25 frames. Craig had to duplicate that shadow falling across his animation model with trim pieces of cardboard in front of the key light. And it worked perfectly. Next was the Gnome King's face up on the side of the mountain. Dorothy looks up and sees an accumulation of rocks that vaguely resemble a human face. The eyes are no more than openings in the rock, shifting to indicate what direction they're looking. Joan Gratz animated this sequence, as well as the hands that open the pathway to the ornament room. The next three sections are all different phases of the Gnome King, as each time he turns someone into an ornament, he becomes more and more human. He was trying to gain power over Dorothy, and in, in, when he transformed, ultimately, uh, in his little uh, deal, his little bet with Dorothy, uh, transformed each of her entourage into an ornament in the ornament room. You know, the idea was that he would be more realized. He would no longer be just in relief at the edge of the stone, but rather kind of start to emerge, you know, little by little until, until ultimately, I mean, he could become a, a three-dimensional being like the humans and, and be able to walk about on the, on the earth as well. And, um, and that was sort of the, his, you know, his uh, arc that was, uh, was really pretty interesting and really pretty fun. Built at one half scale, they were much larger than a standard claymation character, so all the details of the rock would appear natural, but still small enough that the armatures inside could support the weight of the clay. Gnome King Phase 1 seemed to be a giant underground head. What's happened to the scarecrow? Where is he? Oh, I transformed him into an amusing and beautiful ornament for my palace. Barely more than a rock face, 
This is the first time we see him in his throne room. Bill Feasterman was assigned the sequence. The eyes are like the eyes in a Greek statue, more defined but still not human. In one of these shots, we're looking down at Dorothy crying on the Gnome King's lap. A hand emerges from the rock to comfort her. An animated clay hand here, and a big rubber hand shot on stage. Bill built a duplicate lap in clay as well as a hand. And since it's usually true that it's easier to destroy than to create, the film was advanced in the camera and the scene was shot backwards. When viewed, it looks like the hand is emerging out of the rock, not being absorbed into it. Tom Gasek animated the Phase 2 Gnome King. His head was still connected to the wall, but his body was pulled out more, and both his arms were free. The clay head was embedded into the rock. As it moved, clay had to be removed from one side of the head and added to the other, and still made to look like fracturing rock. Mark Gustafson tackled the Phase 3 Gnome King. He now had a set of the half-scale human eyes in his clay head. But now his head and body were totally separated from the back wall except at the very bottom. This is how he looked in the wide shots. But in close-ups, the upper half of his body was put on a metal plate that would allow the Gnome King to easily bend and tilt with the turn of just a few threaded screws. After that point, the Gnome King was a live-action Nicole Williamson in two other stages of Gnome King makeup. Frankly, from my point of view, I felt the, the weakest link was actually the state, the costuming, you know, that, that sort of evolved from uh, where we left off and, and the 3D and the acting uh, on Nicole's part in, in costume. Uh, you know, it was just a little bit, didn't, didn't move in quite the same way and didn't, didn't have quite the same textural qualities and look and so forth. But um, it's really, you know, being, a, being nitpicking, but it, um, uh, when, but it only lasts for a, a very short amount of time, fortunately, because so you know Dorothy can get the better of the Gnome King, and he reverts back into uh, back in sort of to the to the to the stone. To me, at least on the claymation side, one of the unsung heroes is Barry Bruce. He was our animation director. He was our character designer, and he really established the look of the Gnome King. He also animated one of the toughest sequences in the film, called. Somewhere deep underground, the gnome spy from above would come down into the chasm and speak to the gnome king, whom we have not seen yet. Every line, every crack in the rock had to be tracked perfectly. Barry was lucky to get 10 frames done a day, but it looked amazing. Then I got my assignment. I got to kill the gnome king. That's where his giant swollen head rises up on the other side of the ornament room wall and threatens Dorothy and her friends. That's like the best sequence in the movie. How did I get that? The Ornament Room Gnome King was a full-scale chest-up version of the Gnome King built by Barry Bruce. I built the animation version and it had an animatable neck in it, plus it had one of the Nicole Williamson eyes in it. Notice that the other socket's empty. Well, the Gnome King wasn't doing so well at this part of the story. It was mounted on a sturdy table in front of a front projection screen. This is front projection material. I don't have very much left and it's very hard to find. It was developed to be used in traffic signs so you could see them well at night. Here's how it works. There's about a gazillion glass beads embedded into this silvered surface. Once a light hits it, like this one, it bounces the light completely back to the source of the light. See how that works? Of course someone's going to figure out how to use that for the movies. So what if you take a film projector, like this one, and take its image and bounce it off a beam splitter mirror. So it bounces like here, over to here, and onto a front projection screen. Then we take a camera and we put it right there so it's seen exactly what the projector is projecting. Now, if the two of these are perfectly aligned, we can take an actor, put him in the middle, and the shadow that he casts onto the back of the front projection screen will be perfectly blocked by his own body. That way, the actor is now in the scene. Now, don't get me wrong. With today's digital compositing, 
shooting blue or green screen is a better way to go. But back then, blue screen was expensive, it was unreliable, and by the time you were done, your shot was five or six generations away from the camera original, and it looked pretty crappy. With front projection, the compositing is all done in the camera, so you don't have to wait around for weeks while you're waiting for the shot to come back from the lab. This footage of me animating the Gnome King was shot for publicity purposes, but it accurately portrays the process. When we got the eyes, the manufacturer gave us these rubber suction cups for moving the eye, but with all the clay packed up against it, it just didn't work. Instead, four tiny holes were drilled next to the iris. Then a sculpting tool could be used to move it. Notice that you never see the Gnome King's elbow? That's why. It contained all the mechanisms for moving that massive arm and hand. This shot, it was shot backwards. Again, it's easier to destroy than create, as the Gnome King morphs into his final form. Walter told me to have the Gnome King swallow Jack like a man in a restaurant eating a shrimp. Really, has anyone ever seen that? In a restaurant? Now, round about this time, the band on my wristwatch broke. I used that wristwatch all the time to time myself on how long it would take to do each frame and how many frames I could do an hour. It really helped me to pace myself. Well, I don't know why I just didn't buy a new band, but I took that wristwatch and I planted it right there, right on the Gnome King, where I could keep an eye on it. Now in the movies, you usually see a film like this. But the actual frame of film is taller than that, which is how we saw my shot next day in the dailies, with the hands of my wristwatch spinning wildly. Now here's the reason why I had to kill the Gnome King four times, and it comes down to that front projection material. In the scene, the Gnome King is crumbling into boulders, while fire and smoke bellow up behind him. Now I had built a special Gnome King out of aluminum wire and then covered that wire with the rock clay that we used for all the gnomes and the Gnome King. As he crumbled, I would cut off little bits and suspend them in midair using monofilament. But the monofilament created a shadow on the front screen that was recorded by the camera. Well, line removal is easy today, but in 1985, I had to reshoot. Take two, thinner monofilament still visible. Take three. Barry suggested vibrating the monofilament while the camera is taking its third of a second exposure. Still visible. Take four. I was beginning to run out of options. But then I came up with a cunning plan. But I'd have to test the idea first. With the rock clay, stick to glass. Yes! So we placed a sheet of glass on the animation table, but we angled it so that the light from the projector wouldn't go back into the lens of the camera. Then I built the Gnome King right up against the glass. As the Gnome King died and boulders fell, I'd clip off part of the aluminum structure and then take the clay and stick it back onto the glass. And then one frame at a time, I'd slide it down until it animated all the way down to the ground. Now I also had to take a Q-tip and clean the smudge where the clay went down on the glass because otherwise the projection going through the smudge coming back again would leave another dark, dark smudgy area. And this scene is the result. Four takes. When I started, I said, hey, I get to kill the Gnome King. When I finished, I said, hey, I have to kill the Gnome King again. One morning, I saw Bill Feasterman sitting in the break room drinking a cup of coffee. Now, Walter was coming later that day to look at some shots, and Bill had come back with a shot where the Gnome King was sipping out of a cup, but there was some unsteadiness between the cup and his lips. So, Bill said, you know, 
if I sit here like this and do this, maybe Walter will think that's how everybody drinks and he'll approve the shot. Well, he didn't approve the shot. Bill had to reshoot. Gag photos kept on showing up on the bulletin board across from the break room. Like Walter directing the Gnome King personally. <laughs> uh, no idea who built the clay Walter. This one actually appeared in Cinefex magazine. Looks good until you look closely at Mark Gustafson's hand. That's not a sculpting tool. That's a dental mirror. But the best gag photo was based on a scene from the film where gnomes in the wall are frightened that the Gnome King has swallowed an egg. Sometimes, to catch the right mood, Polaroids would be taken as points of reference. Here's Tom Gasick looking suitably frightened, and Mark Gustafson, and Bill Feasterman, and Bruce McKean smiling right at the camera. The title? One out of four people isn't afraid of anything. Then we were done. Or so we thought. Walter was having a hard time finding a spot where the land stopped and the deadly desert began. For a while, he had this shot cut in. But he wanted something better. So he asked Will Vinton to find something in Oregon. And Will sent out a cameraman and a helicopter and, I suppose, a helicopter pilot. And they found this. This is the Sand Lake Recreational Area just south of Tillamook, Oregon. Now in the past 30 years they've planted beach grass to try and stabilize the sand, but for all intents and purposes, this is the Deadly Desert. And in case you're worried that I'm in the middle of the Deadly Desert, have no fear. I'm standing on asphalt. Nothing can get through that. And that was it. We are actually finally done with Return to Oz. Sets were struck, models were archived or torn apart, and we moved on to other projects. But Oz wasn't done with us, not, not just yet. Now one day, months later, the furnace stopped working. Well, repairmen came in and looked at it and said that the filters and the gaskets were all eaten away. Well, nobody could figure out what had caused that until Barry remembered the hundreds of cans of compressed air we used to blow the water away from the rock surface. Something about the propellant in those cans just destroyed that furnace. Why is this thing burned out? It's not, it's almost new. That's funny. <laughs> it wasn't funny then. We have to replace a damn furnace for the studio. <laughs> Oz struck again. We stayed in this building for another three years and then we moved to a bigger facility. People came and left. I stayed for another 15 years, but Return to Oz always remained one of my favorite projects. I wouldn't have missed it for anything. I must say, this life is strange. Two things. Since the time this video was made in 2017, Will Vinton passed away. He was a friend, a good boss, and an even better mentor. He will be sadly missed. Remember when I heaved a sigh of relief that that building was still there? It's not there anymore. It's been wiped off the face of the earth. What you gonna do? Stupid deadly desert. A lot of that didn't actually, you know, make it all the way through. Um, that's, you know, that's just the nature of the of, of projects. The Deadly Desert has no effect on me! Ha <laughs> ha!